John and Margaret were on holiday in Germany. They had been having a picnic at the edge of a forest, and their father and mother had fallen asleep afterwards in the drowsy heat. In front of them was a valley with a river running through it, where the ruined castle they had visited that morning stood on a rocky hill. Behind them, a track led into the shadows of the forest. A man walked past them, weeping bitterly. John, did you see? That man was crying. Funny clothes he was wearing. Red velvet tunic and a blue cloak. Some kind of leggings and a knife. He had a long knife in his belt. Perhaps he's a folk dancer, like those we saw yesterday. But he didn't look as if he was wearing costume, dressing up. Those clothes were shabby, and he looked used to them, as if he wore them every day. And did you see that chain round his neck, with that big medallion thing on it? it? Looked like gold. It couldn't be gold, not a thing that size. And he didn't look rich. He was crying. Something awful had happened to him. Not just an accident or getting hurt. Something really awful. We ought to help him if we can. We could follow him just a little way. We ought to wake Dad and tell him. I don't think we'd better. Mum's always telling us not to disturb him when he's resting. They both told us to go for a walk, but not far. It might not be far. All right. We'll leave a note and tell them we've gone. Where's that pencil you were drawing with? Here. Thanks. Have gone down this track to explore. J and N. Put it on this tree stump under the edge of the picnic basket. That's it. Now, come on. The children went down the track into the forest. The trees grew close together and were immensely tall. They were pines, and the smooth, straight trunks held up a black thatch of boughs that shut out the sunshine. John, what? Want we to go back? We've been walking for ages, and there's no sign of him. Let's go as far as that fallen tree. He must have come this way. There's no other path. The tree John spoke of was a huge fallen pine which lay across the track. Beyond it, the forest seemed even darker. The path was like a tunnel between black pillars. He did come this way. Look, Margaret. His way climbed over the tree trunk. There's a footprint in the ground. And did he have a dog with him? I didn't see one. Nor did I. But there are paw prints here, big ones. Probably a wolf. There aren't any wolves here, are there? Well, there ought to be. Don't you remember? Dad said this forest was called Wolfenwald. Well? It's German. It means wolf wood. Oh. It's all right, Meg. I was only joking. Hey. Come and see. Climb over quickly. What is it? Look. Uh, here, under this broken branch. The gold medallion. When he climbed over the tree, it must have caught on something. And with him crying like that, he wouldn't even notice. It's heavy. It's like a big coin. What's on it? A portrait. A man with long hair and a band round his head. That looks like a crown. What's the word underneath? O T H O, Otho. That's his name, I should think.、Mm. What's on the other side? One word, Fidelis. Is that a name? It's Latin. It means faithful. Let me hold it. It's heavy. I think it is real gold.、It、must be terribly valuable. Perhaps we ought to go a bit further and try and catch him up. Let's run. It's getting dark. It's only because the trees are so thick here. Come on. John. John, let's go back. Meg, come see. 
Look, a cottage. I bet it's his. It's empty. Just look at it. There are cobwebs over the windows. The door's not shut. I can see a table and a bed through the crack. Somebody lives here. There's nobody in. If he does live here, he's been in and gone out again. Open the door a bit more. It is his house. Look, John, there on the bed. The clothes he was wearing. The blue cloak. The red tunic. He came back here, changed his clothes, and went out again. Well, that's fine. We'll go in and put the medallion on top of his clothes. Come on. We'll leave it here for him to find. Now we better run all the way back. Dad will be furious. It's really dark. Come on. <coughs> <coughs> <It's a wolf. coughs> the children stood still, rooted in terror. In the cottage doorway stood an enormous wolf, yellow eyes gleaming, jaws open, and long white fangs glistening. His neck and back seemed to swell as the hair rose. His haunches gathered under him. He was going to spring. John grabbed the nearest thing and threw it. It was the gold medallion, but as John whirled it round his head, the wolf had already turned to bolt. One moment the door was blocked by his terrible crouching shadow. The next he was gone into the darkness of the forest, and the chain and medallion went whizzing after him. Margaret ran to the door and shut it. Quick, John! The window! Close the shutters! No good. We can't stay here. We must chance it and go. But Dad will come to look for us. That's just it. We can't let him. He doesn't know there really are wolves here. We're prepared. We can take something. A weapon. Look, there's a big stick here. This is better. It's the knife the man was carrying. It's funny he went out without it, but lucky for us. Margaret, did you think that wolf was scared? Well, if it had been starving or savage, it wouldn't have run away just because a gold chain was chucked at it. No, but it was running away before I chucked it. Was it really a wolf? Maybe it was that man's dog. It's a pretty rotten dog that runs away from two people who have broken into its master's house. Then it's a pretty rotten wolf, too. I don't think it's terribly dangerous. Come on, we'll go carefully till we see if the track is clear in front of the cottage and then run like smoke. The children crept out of the cottage and peered about. Nothing moved. John took a grip on his stick and they ran. They clambered over the fallen tree and pounded up the last long stretch of the track. There ahead was the picnic place. There was the tree stump where John had left the note under the basket. But there was no basket and no car. No sign of father or mother. Nothing. Us. They must have gone to look for us along the road. Dad can't have seen my note. It must have blown away. They'll be back soon. It's a long way to our hotel. Too far to walk. Anyway, the sensible thing is to stay here. If you know people will come looking for you, stay where you are. What if they don't come back? They're sure to. And I don't believe that was a wolf. Some sort of dog. Alsatian cross or something like that. Let's make a hollow in the ferns and sit down. You'll see. They'll soon be back. And hopping mad with us too, probably. The children made a soft nest in the tall ferns and settled down with their backs against the tree stump. They talked for a little while in whispers, listening for the sound of the returning car. Then they fell asleep. It's a hunt. Meg, it's a hunt. And it's morning. Here they come. John, it's the wolf. They're hunting the wolf. Something fled past the children and vanished into the forest. They caught a glimpse of wild golden eyes, grey fur tagged with mud, a lolling tongue. Then the creature was gone and the hunt was upon them. A man on a bay horse pulled up beside Margaret. 
Which way? Which way? That way. He went up there a moment ago. Hurry. Here, girl. Catch. Sent in the wrong way. Why did you do that? I don't know. It was a wolf, you know. Well, it hadn't hurt us. And did you see its eyes? Yes, I did. Meg, those people. I know. They were dressed like the man who was crying. They're like the people in a story I was reading, in my history book. There was a lady in green velvet. Riding side saddle, and the horses, all that coloured harness and bells. It's a dream. Of course, I've been reading too much, so I'm having this dream. Well, so am I. It's my dream, and you're part of it. No, I feel as if it's my dream, and you're part of it. I suppose it must be a dream. Hey, Meg. The coin that man threw to you. You put it in your pocket.、Mm. Let's see. Here. It's got a head on it, just like the medallion. It's the same man, except he's older. And look, it says Otho Ducks this time. What's that mean? Duke Otho, I suppose. What's on the other side? A bird. Is it an eagle? Something like that. And a date, thirteen forty-two. Thirteen forty-two, and it's new. So was the medallion, the fourteenth century. Dad said that the castle down in the valley was fourteenth century. It must be a dream. That man who asked which way the wolf had gone, he wasn't speaking German, but we're still in Germany. Why was he speaking English? Dream language. I bet if you dreamed about living in ancient Rome or talking to the creatures on a strange planet, they'd be speaking English too. What do we do now? It doesn't matter much if it's only a dream. I'm hungry. Let's go back to the cottage and ask that man to help us. We can show him where the medallion went and give him back his knife. So they went back along the forest track. The cottage was there as it had been yesterday, but the door was shut. They went to the window and peered in. The man was lying on the bed. He opened his eyes and saw them. He's getting up. Let's run. No, wait. He looks pleased. Children, come in. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, you found your medallion. Medallion. The medal on the gold chain round your neck. We found it by the fallen tree, but we threw it at the wolf last night. I'm sorry that the wolf frightened you. Are you hungry?、Uh, we'll eat、uh, bread and honeycomb. And you can tell me your story, who you are, and why you're here. Yes, thank you. Well, it's only a dream, really. But I'll tell you if you don't mind being in someone else's dream. I do not disdain to be part of your dream. I shall tell you in a moment why I am glad of it. Now, how do you come to be here? So John and Margaret told the man their story. You sent the hunt away from the wolf's trail. Why did you do that? I hate hunts, and the wolf hadn't hurt us. Is he tame? No, he's wild indeed, a fierce wolf of the forest, but only in darkness. When you saw him at the door, it was half light. He was still human enough to be afraid of hurting you, but he knew in a few moments' time, when darkness came fully, he would not be able to stop himself. He would attack you, so he ran away even before you threw the gold medallion. I thought it must be magic or something to make a wolf run away. Perhaps it is, a protection against evil. I call it an amulet. How did you find it? It wasn't easy. It fell among thorns and nettles. It took me some time, 
Although I saw where it fell. You saw where it fell? How? Were you here when the wolf came? Yes, I was here. I was the wolf. A werewolf? A man who changes at night into a wolf? But you couldn't be. You look so kind and... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Little maid, it wouldn't surprise me if you ran screaming from my cottage. But you're brave and have noble manners. It's time I told you my story. My name's Martian. Once I was the friend of Duke Otho, the ruler of this land. He lives in the castle beyond the forest's edge. Otho and I grew up together as boys. We shared everything. When we were fifteen, Otho had the goldsmith make two amulets. Your medallion? Yes, mine and his. On one was a portrait of Otho, on the other my portrait. We gave them to each other with promises of friendship. Then, when Otho's father died, he became the duke, and I was with him always to help him. He trusted me with all his secrets. Then, five years ago, Otho was hurt when he fell from his horse. Since then, he's been lame, unable to walk or ride. I had to lead his men for him and train his young son, Prince Crispin. One day, Otho accused me of plotting against him and stealing his son's love. He was often in pain and it made him bad-tempered. But he was overheard by a man called Almeric. This man was really plotting against the Duke. He thought I'd begin to hate Otho after he'd spoken so harshly to me. He asked me to join in his plots. When I refused, he was afraid I would tell the Duke. He cast a spell on me. By day I'm still Mardian, but darkness forces the wolf's shape on me, as you've seen. But why can't you go to the Duke in the daytime and tell him everything? I cannot go openly to the castle. Almeric has men watching out for me. I'd be killed or shut in a dungeon until night. And you know what would happen then to the great grey wolf? But the Duke must have sent people out looking for you when you disappeared. He didn't miss me. Almeric the Enchanter has taken my shape. He lives at the castle as my Lord Mardian. People think he's you. Even the Duke? Yes, he's exactly like me. Except that he has no amulet. He has told the Duke it's lost. And since you can't get near the Duke, someone else has to try. Is that it? You want us to do it. Show him the amulet and tell him your story. For every evil spell there is a remedy. You were brought to me by the amulet. You're young, but you had the courage to face the wolf, and later you saved him from his killers. That's why I put my fate and Duke Otho's in your hands. But what I ask you to do may be dangerous, for this is a spell and not a dream. I'll go out into the forest and leave you alone. At midday I'll come back. If you decide to help me, you'll still be here. If not... Walk away out of the forest. I'm sure you will come safely out of the spell and find your way home. It is your right to choose. And Mardian turned and went out into the sunlight, leaving the children to themselves. That was part one of A Walk in Wolf Wood by Mary Stewart. The narrator was Crawford Logan, the children were played by Beowulf Grimbley and Jill Schilling, and Mardian by Joe Dunlop. The story was adapted for radio and produced by Paddy Beachley. Part two, The Wolf Sickness. John and Margaret were on holiday in Germany. When they followed a weeping man into a forest, they found themselves back in the 14th century. Everything belonging to their own time, their parents and the car they were travelling in, had vanished. The man they followed was called Mardian. 
he was under a wolf spell. Each evening at sunset he turned into a great grey wolf. In the morning, at sunrise, he returned to the shape of a man. But each day, as soon as it was light, lords and ladies rode out from the nearby castle to hunt the wolf, for the enchanter, Almeric, who had cast the spell upon him, had offered a reward for the grey wolf's head. Mardian told the children, Yes, once I was a friend of Duke Otho, who lives in the castle and rules this land. Now Almeric is plotting against him. He has taken my shape. He pretends to be Lord Mardian. I am afraid that Otho and his son, Prince Crispin, will both die from his enchantments. Then Almeric will make himself Duke. There is just one thing we can use against him. He looks exactly like me, but he does not have this gold amulet Otho gave me when we were boys. He has told the Duke it's lost. It was the amulet, I believe, that brought you back into my time to help me, if you will. But what I ask of you is dangerous, so do not agree to it lightly. What do you want us to do? When night comes, I can show you how to get into the castle. There is a secret room Otho and I discovered when we were boys. Almeric will not expect danger from two children. If John mixes with the other boys, he will be called on to serve the Duke in time. Then, John, show him my amulet and tell him my story. But let no one else see it or touch it. Put it straight into his hands. He will remember the promises we made. But suppose he doesn't believe me. Then I must stay a forest wolf until they hunt me to death. I think he will believe us. I think this is what the enchantment happened for. There were children's clothes at the cottage, a dark blue woolen tunic and dark green hose for John, and a long grey dress for Margaret with a brown surcoat over it. John had a hunting knife strapped to his belt. It's sharp. I have to watch not to cut my mouth when I'm eating. How did I know that? Do I pick up my food on the point of this knife? Yes. Is that how you eat in your own time? We use forks, I think. It's hard now to remember. But I know what to do with this knife. Does that mean we sort of belong in this time now? Yes, I think you do. Has it not struck you that you and I talk the same language, yet you told me that you came from a land across the sea? We thought it was stream language. Aren't you speaking English, Mardian? I think you had better not call me Mardian. You must call the enchanter Mardian and never make a mistake. Call me Wolf. And no, little maid, I do not speak English. And to me, your name sounds like Greta and John is Hans. Now listen. If anyone asks who you are, say you are the grandchildren of Lady Grisel. She's very old and cannot remember all her grandchildren. Even if she says she does not know you, no one will be surprised. Now, little Greta, if anyone questions you, what will you say? So please you, sir, we are Hans and Greta, and the Lady Grisel is our grandam. You see, you curtsied without thinking. No one in the castle will think you any different from the other children there. Now, Hans, take my amulet and keep it safe. It is near sunset. As soon as twilight falls... I must go out into the forest in my wolf shape to kill and eat. You must go into this inner room, lock the door and put the clothes chest against it. Close the shutters on the window. Whatever you hear, do not open the door. Oh, but we trust you. No, do not. Wait until I have been into the forest. After that I shall be safe. You will be able to trust me then till morning. I will come back after the moon has risen. When you see the moonlight through the shutters, you may open them and watch for me. Do not be afraid. If you do as I say, you will be safe. Don't worry, dear wolf. We're not afraid, and we'll do exactly as you say. Good night, little maid. Good night, Hans. When I see you later, I shall not be able to speak to you. I wish you good fortune for tomorrow. The sun had dropped below the trees. It was getting dark. The children went into the inner room, pushed the heavy chest against the door and barred the shutters. 
On the other side of the door they heard a sliding thud and a low moan, followed by silence. Then came a yawn, as if some animal had woken from sleep, followed by an eager, savage whining and a low, soft snarl. Something sniffed along the gap at the bottom of the door, then a heavy body hurled itself against it. The children crouched in the dark, holding hands, while the wild beast that was the enchanted Mardian growled for their blood. He went at last. They heard him race across the room and out into the garden. Far away in the forest, they heard the long, eerie wolf howl. The children sat on the clothes chest and waited for perhaps an hour, a very long hour, until the moonlight showed white between the shutters. Then they opened them and watched for the wolf's return. He came at last. They could see him as clearly as if it were day. The gleaming eyes, lolling tongue, and black smears of blood on jaws and chest. He put his muzzle down to the long wet grass and rolled, cleaning the horrible stains from his coat. The children hauled the chest away from the door and went into the other room. Wolf was bigger than they remembered. His shoulders were level with Margaret's chest. His eyes could have looked straight into hers, but his head drooped as he remembered what his wolf's nature had made him do. At that moment, the children realized how much they hated the false enchanter. We are ready, Lord Mardian. I've got the amulet safe. The werewolf trotted out into the moonlight, and the children followed him. They went along the track to the edge of the forest. Below them lay the castle. Wolf led them to a barred window, half hidden by a tangle of ivy at the foot of the castle wall. He looked at them, his yellow eyes gleaming in the moonlight, and made a whining sound. John went down on his knees by the window and took hold of the grating. With a couple of sharp tugs, it lifted out. Wolf went past him like a shadow and vanished into the black hole. John followed, and Margaret wriggled through after them. They were inside the secret room. As their eyes grew used to the dark, they saw a table, a chair, and a big cupboard, dusty and unused. In the opposite wall was a door with an iron latch. Wolf ran to the door and looked at John. The boy opened it carefully. The secret room led into the castle cellars. Wolf led them past huge vats of wine and up a wide stone stairway. Moonlight came through a barred window, lighting the steps. At the top was another big door. It opened into a corridor where a smoky torch was burning in an iron bracket. At the end of the corridor was the door to the big hall where they would go tomorrow. Tonight they must stay hidden. They went back to the secret room. Wolf put his paws on the windowsill, ready to leave them and the castle that had once been his home. He raised his head in the moonlight. Quick, he's going to howl. Wolf, dear wolf, hush, you mustn't. Margaret knelt beside Wolf and put her arms round his neck. She could feel the dreadful sound welling up in his throat from the deep spring of grief inside his body. He swallowed and his teeth clicked shut on the sound. The grey head moved and a tongue licked Margaret's cheek. Please don't worry. We'll remember everything. We'll be all right, sir. And we'll come down here tomorrow night to meet you. Perhaps the Duke will be here with us, waiting for you. Dear Wolf, take care. The Wolf gave them one last look, leapt through the window, and was gone. They slept soundly. The morning sun and the noise of the wolf hunt returning woke them. We'd better go if we want something to eat. 
Wolf said everyone gets up terribly early, and they have dinner about nine. Then nothing else till supper time. If we get separated, we'll meet here again tonight. Right. Let's get on with it, shall we? It's my guess this is going to be a difficult day. They peeped out of the secret door. There was no one about. They made their way through the cellar, up the steps, into the corridor beyond, and let themselves through the second door. They turned a corner, and found themselves face to face with a man in a long blue robe and a large lady in black, with a headdress like the horns of a Highland cow. What's this? What are you doing here, boy? Why aren't you in the hall with the others? Is there not enough work for you all? With my lords just back from hunting and hungry enough to eat their horses? I'm sorry, sir. I was on my way. Did the hunt catch the quarry? Not they. So he still roams the woods to eat disobedient children. Now, where have you been? What is this wench doing here? Yes, indeed, my young madam. What do you hear? It was the little dog, madam. What little dog? Please, madam, I don't know, but I saw it running this way, and I thought it was lost, so I ran after it. And I saw my sister coming here, so I ran after her to fetch her back. Well, if I find a single cask tampered with in the cellar, I'll whip you myself. What's your name? Hans, sir. So please you, the Lady Grizel is our granddam. Oh, what would the Lady Grizel say if she knew of your conduct, you shameless hussy? Come along, young madam. Back to the nurseries at once. And you too, boy. Get to the hall and bestir yourself about the serving. The lady rustled off with Margaret in tow, and John, dodging a cuff from the steward, ran into the great hall. It was an enormous room with high arched windows through which blazed the morning sun. Down both sides were long, narrow tables where people sat eating with their fingers from wooden plates. Across one end of the hall was a platform with another table on it, covered with a white cloth, where men and women ate off silver. At the center, under a crimson canopy, was a chair with a carved back, and in it sat the duke. On the duke's left sat. Mardian. It took John a few seconds to convince himself that it was really Almeric the Enchanter. He was so like the real Mardian. The Duke turned to speak to him, and John saw, glinting on the Duke's breast, a heavy gold chain and amulet. Even when the Duke smiled, his face looked ill and sad. John slid his hand into his pouch and fingered Mardian's amulet. Just you wait, Almeric. If the Duke only knew. You boy, look sharp and serve at the kitchen end. John saw a stream of boys hurrying to and fro between the tables and a big door at the end of the hall. He ran after them and found himself in the kitchens. Someone thrust a dish of hot pies into his hands and he ran back into the hall. Soon he began to enjoy himself. He learned to thread his way between the yapping dogs wrangling over scraps. And to dodge the bones people tossed over their shoulders, he even managed, like the other boys, to snatch a few pieces for himself from the dishes. What worried him was the knowledge that his chances of coming near the duke were very poor indeed. The high table was served by pages dressed in black velvet. By the duke's chair stood a fair boy of about John's age. He handed the duke his food and poured his wine. Then knelt with a silver bowl while his master washed his hands. No one else came near the duke. At the back of the platform was the bodyguard, a dozen armed men with glinting spears. So John ran and served and snatched food, and wondered how he was ever to come near the duke, and what had happened to Margaret. Margaret, taken off to the women's rooms among girls and nurses and tumbling babies, found like John. That among so many people she was hardly noticed, but it was hard to see how she could help Wolf. One of the nurses sent her out to play in a garden, a strip of grass and flower beds inside the battlements. Looking over a wall into another garden below, Margaret saw a boy there. He's just like the portrait of Otho on the amulet. It must be Prince Crispin, the Duke's son. Someone's coming. It's Mardian. No, it must be the enchanter. But he 
looks so much like Mardian. Why were you not at dinner, Prince Crispin? People will think you are sick, too. It doesn't matter what they think. I hate to see them all watching my father, wondering how long he will live. Where do these rumours come from, Lord Mardian? My father is lame, yes. He is often in pain. But he is far from dying. My prince, you are old enough to know the truth. What truth? Duke Otho is sick, and if no cure is found, he will die. I don't believe it. The doctors will find the doctors the doctors have done all they can. But what is wrong with him? He says he has no strength. He is like a man under a spell that takes away his will to live. Don't you think so? The doctors say he could stand and learn to walk again. Certainly he could ride. But he will try nothing and go nowhere. Doesn't this seem like an enchantment to you, Lord Mardian? You're right. But I did not want to tell you. This is the wolf sickness. Have you not heard of it? Why do you think we ride out every day to hunt the grey wolf? For sport. For more than that. Ever since the great grey wolf came to ravage this countryside, your father has been sick. And if we kill the wolf, he will get better? Uh, who can say? But everyone knows that evil men can change themselves into wolves. Men like Almerick? Like whom? You remember Almerick? He vanished quite suddenly about two years ago. My father distrusted him. So did you. Ah, uh, yes. I remember. Perhaps he turned into the great wolf. People said he knew something of the magic arts. Mardian, I have an idea. In a few days, it will be my birthday. Why don't we celebrate it by a grand wolf hunt? A hunt lasting all day. <laughs> I might persuade my father to be carried in a litter to watch. No. Why not? If he believes himself that his sickness is magic... No, it would be dangerous. <laughs> we will speak of this again later, my dear prince. Come with me now. I have some documents to show you. The beast! The beast! You wait, Almeric. Greta! Greta, where are you? Here, madam. Coming. Just before dark, John and Margaret met in the secret room. No one suspects me. It would be fun if it wasn't so serious. But I can't see how I'm ever going to speak to the Duke. What happened to you? Did you find out anything? Yes. I heard the Prince and Almeric talking. Almeric told him the Duke is dying. He called it the wolf sickness. But I don't think the Prince trusts Almeric, for all he looks and sounds just like Mardian. We'll tell Wolf when he comes. Look, Margaret, I have to go. It's supper time, and I'm in a team to wait at table. You'd better go, then. Be careful. I'll be back in time for Wolf. Don't worry, you'll be all right till I come back. So John went, and Margaret sat down alone in the secret room to wait for the moon to rise and Wolf to come. A Walk in Wolf Wood is by Mary Stewart. The narrator is Crawford Logan, the parts of Mardian and Elmerick were played by Joe Dunlop, the children by Beowulf Grimley and Jill Schilling. You also heard Rusty Livingstone, Martin Friend and Anne Rosenfeld. And that ends school's broadcasting for today. Part 3, The Broken Chain. John and Margaret had been taken back in time to the 14th century. In Wolfwood, they met Lord Mardian, who was under a cruel enchantment. Each night, this gentleman was changed into a grey wolf, compelled to hunt and kill his prey in the forest. While in the castle of Duke Otho, the wicked enchanter Almeric made himself look like Mardian and took his place as the Duke's friend and helper. 
By his spells, Almeric was making the Duke sick, even to death. One thing the Enchanter did not have, a gold amulet that Otho had given Mardian when they were boys. On it was a portrait of the Duke and the word faithful. It was the magic of the amulet which had brought the children into Mardian's time to help him. At the end of their first day in Duke Otho's castle, John and Margaret met in a secret room behind the cellar. Wolf Mardian had told John to show the amulet to Otho when he was alone and tell him the whole story, but it seemed impossible for either of the children to get anywhere near the Duke. I can't see how I'll ever be able to speak to him alone. He has two special pages, Dennis and Justin, to wait on him. They wear clothes of black velvet with a silver badge. No other boys get near him. And I'm not allowed to leave the women's rooms. I pretended I had to take a message for someone to get here. Well, I'd better go back. I came down early to get out of joining in the boys' games in the courtyard. War games. Sort of mock fights. You should see them. Black eyes and broken noses are the least of it. <sighs> but it'll be supper time soon, and I have to serve at table. I'm in a team. You'd better go, then. Be careful. Yes. I'll be back in time for Wolf. Don't move the grating from the window till he comes. Don't worry. You'll be all right till I get back. At supper in the great hall, John served wine, pouring it from a large jug, while the other boys in his team ran to and fro with platters of food. The people ate and drank until many of them began to fall asleep at the tables. When the Duke and his guard left the hall, John took a jug of wine and some scraps of food for Margaret and slipped away. In the passage that led to the cellar, a boy was sitting on the floor, hugging his arms to his body as if in pain. It was one of the boys John had seen waiting on the Duke earlier in the day. What's the matter? Nothing. You're the Duke's page, aren't you? Yes, I'm Justin. Who are you? My name's Hans. Your lips cut, and your eye. You've been in a fight. There were four of them. I did try, but I'm no good at that sort of thing. Anybody would be clobbered if four bullies set on him. Why did they do it? What had you done? Nothing. Only I'm no good at war games. The Duke chose me for his page because I'm quiet and I can sing. The other boys are jealous. They call me girlish and mock me. This afternoon I missed the quintain three times, so they set on me. And tonight it's my turn to serve the Duke, but he mustn't see me. If he finds out, he'll punish them, and then they'll kill me or make my life horrible. Look, can I help? Can I do anything? You seem kind. You're not like the other boys. Would you find Dennis? Ask him to serve the Duke for me. Perhaps by tomorrow I'll look all right. Then the Duke will never know. What do you have to do tonight? The Duke has a drink before he goes to sleep. A posset. Dennis and I take it in turns to make it for him. This posset? How do you make it? You heat the milk and put it in the golden cup with the herbs and spices and special wine. But Dennis knows. Tell Dennis to do it. I feel sick. All right. But if I'm to get into the Duke's rooms, to find Dennis, I'll have to look like one of the Duke's pages. We'd better change clothes. Here, I'll help you. John helped Justin to change clothes, and then, dressed in black velvet with the silver badge on his tunic, he took his wine jug and ran to the Duke's private rooms. There were two guards at the door. You're late, boy. Look sharp, or the Duke will have the skin off you. Wait, you're not Justin. Who are you? I'm Hans. The Duke sent for me. I'm to be trained as his page, too. All right, youngster, in you go. He's a bit glum tonight, so let's hope you make a good posset. They lifted their spears, and John went through into the Duke's room. The Duke sat by a log fire, staring into the flames, but he was not alone. At his feet, with his back to the door, sat a boy playing a lute. It was Dennis. He must have noticed Justin's absence and taken his place. John clutched the amulet and looked around. He saw a table, and on it, a golden cup, a bowl of milk, a tall, gilded jar of wine, and wooden spice boxes. 
he realized that there was a way he could give the amulet to the Duke without Dennis seeing it. He tiptoed to the table, dropped the amulet into the golden cup, and covered it with wine from his own jug. He pretended to mix the drink. The music was coming to an end. Thank you, Dennis. It grows late. Make haste with that drink, boy. My lord, this boy, I've never seen him before. He's not one of the royal pages. So, who are you, boy? My lord, Justin was ill. He asked me to send Dennis to you, but I couldn't find him. I asked who you were. My name is Hans. Look, my lord, he's made your drink with his own wine, as the jug he brought with him. Our wine hasn't been touched. God! Oh, there, God! My lord? Hold that boy. Hold him fast. Don't let him spill that wine. Where do you come from, boy? And who is your father? You wouldn't know him, sir. I don't come from this dukedom. I'll tell you everything. But first, let me give you a message from Lord Mardian. Mardian? He was with me a short time ago. Did he send you with that jug of wine? No. Dennis. Send to find my Lord Mardian. My Lord. Ask him to come here. No! I thought so. What message do you bring that Lord Mardian could not give me himself? The message is in the wine. I'm sure it is. A message from my enemies. No, if there you is just... something in the cup, my Lord. You can see it under the wine. Well, Hans, you brought it here. Now offer it to me in a seemly way. Sir? Perhaps you have forgotten that my pages taste my wine before it is given to me. Yes, I thought you had. Now drink. Yes, my lord. Stop him! Drop down! The guard knocked the cup from his hand and the wine splashed on the floor. The amulet fell ringing into the firelight. The duke's hand went up to touch the golden medallion on his own breast. Sir, that was the message. Now, may I tell you, please... The Duke sent everyone else out of the room. He didn't once interrupt as John told his story. John finished. My sister's down there now in the secret room, waiting for Wolf Mardian. If you'd come down there, my lord. You see, he has to stay a wolf until sunrise. But if you'd stop anyone harming him till then, you'd see. God? Sup! Sup! God. Call the captain on duty and servants to carry my chair. Sir. We'll go down to the cellar. Find my Lord Mardian. Or as this boy would say, the man we know is my Lord Mardian. Yes, my lord. Hans, I have listened to you, but I cannot condemn anyone without proof. My lord, hey! my lord. Sir, boy. There's a great wolf in the cellar. My Lord Mardian is there with it. He's protecting a young girl with only a knife in his, his hand. His leg. My lord, it's the great grey wolf himself. Margaret, waiting in the secret room for Wolf to come, had heard footsteps approaching the door from the cellar. She squeezed into a narrow, dark space between the big cupboard and a corner of the room. Not a moment too soon. A man came in with a lantern. It was the enchanter, Almeric. He opened the cupboard and put things on the table. Margaret peered out. He had his back to her and was mixing something in a flask over a flame. Alas, poor Mardian. Come nearer, poor wolfman. Tell me where your amulet is hidden. But soon it will not matter. Duke Otho will not live out the old moon. And when he's dead, I can do what I please with the boy. And you, poor wolf, will be hunted to death in my forests. Wolf mustn't come. But the light will warn him, surely. Almeric stirred liquid in the flask over the yellow flame. It bubbled and grey steam rose from it. The enchanter took a pinch of powder from a small leather bag hanging round his neck, taking it so carefully between thumb and forefinger that Margaret knew it must be deadly. He sprinkled it on the liquid. The smoke went white, then green. He took the flask from the flame and set it on the table to cool. The liquid in it was black. Margaret saw a movement in the dark liquid. 
It was her reflection mirrored in the dark glass, and the enchanter had seen it too. So, come out of that corner. Who are you? My name is Greta. I was exploring the cellars. No lies. Come here. Oh, let go of me. Now tell me who you are and what you're doing here. No wolf! Run away! It's him! Almerick! The wolf was at the window. His fangs were bared and snarling, his eyes glaring like lamps. The enchanter held Margaret in an iron grip as she struggled and kicked. She could feel him laughing as she shouted again, Run away, wolf! Run away! <laughs> no, come in, my dear Mardian. Come in quietly. <laughs> further. Stay exactly there. I have a knife. If you move towards me, or if you try to go back through the window, you know what will happen to this child. Stay there. What a good beast. Wolf, dear, run away. It's all right. He can't really hurt me, you know. For me, it's just a dream or a spell. You know it is. So go now, quickly, please, Wolf. Oh, no, he will not do that. Now, Mardy and the werewolf, if you wish this little maid to stay unhurt, go in front of us into the big cellar. Slowly, Wolf walked out of the secret room into the cellar and lay down, head on paws, like a waiting lion. Swiftly, Almeric shut the door behind them. Now, Wolf was trapped. Now, my dear Greta, your friend the werewolf cannot escape until he has a man's hand to lift the latch. But before that, I shall have called the guard and we shall have rid the country of the plague of the great wolf. Beast! <laughs> ah! Quietly now. If you kick again, be sure I shall hurt you. Oh. And be sure, pretty maid, if this is a dream or a spell, you're trapped in it. As surely as your wolf is trapped in this cellar. Now, tell me, where is the amulet? What amulet? Don't be stupid. You have it or you know where it is. It is the only thing that could make Otho listen to a wild tale of werewolves and magic. So tell me where it is. I haven't got it. I... Meg saw a wolf stand up. His head cocked slightly to one side, his ears erect. He could hear something. It must be John coming. She raised her voice to warn him. Lord Almeric, I haven't got the amulet. I hid it. Where? I hid it in the garden, Lord Almeric. Under a bush. I buried it, Lord Almeric. Stop shouting. No, John, don't come in. He's here. Almeric's here. The wolf! The wolf! The wolf! The wolf broke in and would have killed the child. Slay him! Stop! Put up your swords. Almeric loosed his grip on Margaret and she broke free. Wolf bunched his muscles to hurl himself at his enemy. If he had sprung, one of the men's swords would have cut him down. Margaret ran to him, flung herself on her knees and clasped both hands round his neck. No, Wolf, no! The great wolf's head went down and the bristles flattened along his back. He lay down before Duke Otho's chair. The wolf lies at the Duke's feet. Sorcery! The girl is a witch! Certainly there is sorcery here, and evil. We shall discover the truth of it. My lord, you yourself have been accused of sorcery. You, with the beast and these children, must stand trial of it. You, wolf, if you are truly what these children would have me believe, need fear nothing. But my people fear you. So until the truth is known, you will let them bind you. Bring chains and bind them both. The sorcerer began to protest, but the guards bound his wrists with chains, gently, for he still looked like Lord Mardian. Nervously, they approached the great wolf, but he never moved and let them shackle him. The children will stay by me. We will go outside to wait for sunrise. It was still dark. Servants carrying smoky torches lined the wall of the garden. 
The men set down the Duke's chair, and in front of him, Almeric and the wolf stood face to face in their chains. Time passed. No one spoke. The enchanter's lips moved silently as if he were repeating a spell. John whispered something in the Duke's ear. The Duke took off his cloak of royal scarlet lined with fur, and John put it round Wolf so that only his head showed. The sky was light. The servants put out their torches. At last came the sun. It dazzled their eyes. The chains fell from Almeric from the wolf. There was no wolf. Where Wolf had been stood Mardian, tall and upright in the cloak of royal scarlet. Facing him stood the false enchanter, clutching in terror at the leather bag round his neck. The falling chain had torn it open, and from it white powder was trickling down his robe over his hands that scrabbled to stop it. Where it fell, the dew on the grass began to smoke. Then the enchanter, throwing up his hands, gave a great cry. Ah! A great grey shape fled away towards the darkness of Wolfwood. Prince Crispin and his friends came running, dressed for riding, carrying spears. Come on, come on, come on! The wolf! The wolf! Where? Where? Did you see it? The great wolf! To hunt! To hunt! Come, friends, join us! We shall have good sport today! No one moved. In front of the chair that had carried him for five weary years, Duke Otho stood upright and smiling. At his feet knelt Mardian. The Duke raised him, saluted him with a kiss, and round his neck hung the golden amulet marked Faithful. Oh, oh, yes. Father, what is this? Are you cured of your sickness? Will someone tell me what is going on? Mardian, what has happened? Mardian, Mardian! Mardian! The children walked out across the drawbridge. They were half dazed from the feasting and splendor of the celebrations in the castle. Ahead of them rose the trees of Wolfwood, green in the sunlight. They turned to look back. Mardian was standing in the great gateway. He lifted a hand in salute. Behind him, the castle stood fluttering with flags and alive with music and rejoicing. The children turned. The sun flashed from the windscreen of a parked car. Their father was coming down the road to meet them. John, Margaret, time to go. Behind them, the ruined castle lifted its empty turrets to the afternoon sky. A Walk in Wolfwood is by Mary Stewart. The narrator was Crawford Logan. The children were played by Beowulf Grimbley and Jill Schilling, Almeric by Joe Dunlop, and other parts by Bob Doherty, Adam Smith, Jason Clark, Rusty Livingston, Michael Deeks, Martin Friend, and David Bradshaw. And there we end schools. <laughs>